Thank you, sir. You got it? I'll tell you what makes a bourbon a bourbon. There are a lot of misconceptions out there amongst people. I travel the world talking about our products, and it's amazing. Ah, here you go. That's what I need, a little tongue lube here. Good batch. But you know, the, the thing, you know, a lot of people think that bourbon has to be made in Kentucky. That's total garbage. I mean, even they take it further. I had a guy today, this morning. It's amazing. You think people really know what's going on. He said, well, doesn't bourbon have to come from Bourbon County, Kentucky? No way. There's no distilleries in Bourbon County. Uh, Bourbon County is a dry county in Kentucky. You can't get a legal drink or whiskey in Bourbon County. Now, if you've got a bootlegger, you can call, go down to the third oak tree, leave $20, go to the fifth one, and there'll be a bottle waiting for you. But, you know, it's one of those deals that three-fourths of our state of Kentucky is dry. So, you know, it's, uh, it is kind of amazing. Out of 120 counties, there's only 30 that you can actually buy a bottle of bourbon. But now they've got these moist areas. We were kind of talking about that this morning. A thing I did. Moist is where if you have a restaurant that seats 100 people, 70% of the gross comes from food you can serve, beverage, alcohol. But there's no buying of any package, no package stores at all. Now they'll drive 50 miles to a wet county and buy it and bring it back, but that's just kind of the way it is. But you know, bourbon has to be made in the United States. That is the only geographic law regarding bourbon. Uh, the next thing is we have to use a new barrel every time we age the bourbon. No reusing the barrels. No used cooperage can be used. Now that part of the law, they say the Cooper's Union went to Washington, D.C. and lobbied to get that put in law so they could sell us more barrels. Knowing the way it works in D.C., I'm sure they showed up with a sack full of money Probably a couple of cases of good whiskey and yeah, who knows, maybe a frisky woman or two. <laughs> Persuade them to get that put in there because that means we have to buy new barrels every time we age the bourbon. Uh, if you reuse the barrel, you can't call it bourbon. You know, we do roughly 300,000 new barrels a year. So, you know, it's a pretty big business for them. But using a new barrel allows us to get the job done in the length of time that we do. Because the next law is we cannot add any colors or flavors to bourbon. Uh, you know, we have to get it through our distillation and aging in those charred white oak barrels. I'll talk a little bit about how that works here in a minute, but just to, to get through it so we can get these rules down. Now that's what makes us different from the black label product made in Tennessee. Uh, I'm not going to mention their name for fear lightning might strike me here today. <laughs> but what they do is they leach their unaged whiskey through a bed of maple charcoal before it goes into the barrel to be aged. When they do that, they're adding flavor. That's why it's not a bourbon. So many people say, oh, it's not a bourbon because it's made in Tennessee, and bourbon's got to be made in Kentucky. I said, time out. That's not right. It's because of the leaching process. There's two distilleries in Kentucky, that may, I mean, Tennessee, that make whiskey. Both of them do it that way. That's the way the early Tennessee whiskey makers made their whiskey. It's called the Lincoln County Mellowing System. And it's just what they do the way they make it. Is it right or wrong? Who says? But if you're going to be a bourbon, you cannot do that. Corn, did I talk about that corn? Corn has to be the majority grain in bourbon. I think I did. Uh, you know, that comes from the early settlers that migrated into Kentucky in the 1700s. You know, they told people if you would come into Kentucky, grow the native grain of corn, then they would give you land. You could come down, stake out your claim, you get this piece of ground. So that's where that comes from. The early settlers who came into Kentucky, a lot of them were distillers from up in the Pennsylvania area around Pittsburgh. The Whiskey Rebellion was going on. They were running them out of Pennsylvania because they were trying to charge taxes you know, for the whiskey they made to pay for the Revolutionary War. Uh, those guys tried to hold a revolt. Uh, President Washington sent in a couple thousand troops. There was about 75 distillers. The numbers were bad, so the distillers turned tail and ran like hell. Probably didn't stop till they got to Kentucky, but uh, you know they were outnumbered so bad. I've, I've done some stuff up there in the, at the David Bradford House where all this took place in Pennsylvania. It's kind of wild when you hear the story. I mean, they sent so many troops; those guys had no shot, so they just took off. They were all making rye whiskey, <laughs> but they came into Kentucky and corn was the grain. 
So that's why corn has to be the majority grain still today in your bourbon recipe or mash bill. When we distill the bourbon, it cannot be higher than 160 proof when it comes off the steel. Uh, when it goes into the barrel to be aged, it cannot be higher than 125 proof. And when we bottle it for the consumer, it's got to be greater than 80 proof. The last law regarding bourbon, I always kind of joke about us, it had to be written by a lawyer because it just said bourbon must be aged in a charred oak container for a period of time. And that opens the door for a lot of stuff. You know, it's, to quote my good friend Jimmy Russell, who's the master distiller at Wild Turkey, we were here in Chicago for Whiskey Fest. It's been held 10 years ago probably now. And we had all this, had this media luncheon. Now they get a bunch of distillers together and put a lot of media out in front of us and let us have two or three drinks before we get started. You know somebody's going to say something crazy. But Jimmy's sitting beside me and he kicked me. And he said, I want to tell everybody about the 1515 rule. And I kind of looked at him, what the hell are you talking about? And Jimmy said, if you had new charred oak buckets, you put your new whiskey, which we call White Dog, in these buckets and carry it 15 feet or leave it 15 seconds, that's long enough. <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, the laws were written. He's dead on, you know. But they, that's the reason I say a lawyer had to be involved, because they took it a little further and said, well, if you call your bourbon straight bourbon whiskey, it must be aged two years. If you call it Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, it must be aged in the state of Kentucky for at least two years. So instead of just saying that bourbon had to be aged two years, they put all these different loopholes and angles. So 